All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. So last time we talked about the different acid and base theories, and which one is the most important? Lewis, right? So the Lewis acid base theory being the more important. Okay, and so if you think about a, the very simple reaction of a proton reacting with hydroxide ion, Right, and so there's lone pairs of electrons. That's going to give water. Right? What is the Lewis acid and what is the Lewis base on the left side of the equation? So which one of which one of these is the acid? Which one of these is the base? This is the base. Isn't that the acid? Yeah, and why is this the acid? Well, that's the Brunstad theory, which you're not wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong, but let's think about it from the viewpoint of Lewis. It's accepting electrons. When why can it accept an electron, or a pair of electrons? Because it only has, it's positive charge, it only has one electron. Okay, so let's think about that. How many electrons on the periodic table does hydrogen have? One, one right? So if it's positively charged, it has how many electrons? None. So it can accept a pair. You're right with that. But it's, it, only, it has no electrons, so it can accept a pair, right? So since this is an electron pair acceptor, it is a Lewis acid, right? So this is going to be our Lewis acid, okay? Hydroxide, therefore, must be our what? Our Lewis base. And obviously, not only is it negatively charged, but it has lone pairs of electrons, right? So now, how do I visualize that reaction? How do these things actually come together? How do, we, how do we represent it? We represent it with a double headed arrow from one of the electron pairs to the proton. Our arrows show the movement of electrons, not the movement of atoms. This arrow tells me that I'm moving this electron pair to this hydrogen. And of course, when you move an electron pair, the atom that those uh, electron pairs belong to move as well. But what we're showing here is just the movement of the electrons. This is telling me I'm making a bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen to make water. Right? Where the black hydrogen drawn here is the hydrogen on the left hand side of the equation. Okay? We've just made a simple Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. If you can comprehend this, and I kid you not, it really is this simple, you'll get most of biochemistry. Most of what you're going to be dealing with is nothing more than a Lewis acid reacting with a Lewis base. Okay? Now, that's an overly simplified example. The trick is to be able to identify the Lewis acid and the Lewis base in all contexts. So let's, let's think about how we can identify Lewis acids and Lewis bases. So let's start with that. And let's suppose we have an organic molecule, something like acetone. What's the functional group? It is a ketone. Yeah, so this is a ketone, right? And so we're going to learn something about ketones here. And let's suppose we react it with cyanide. Which one of those do you suspect is going to be the Lewis acid and which one of those do you suspect is going to be the Lewis base? It is. Can you tell me why? Well, I see that there's the electron on the other one. <laughs> well, I've also got electrons on acetone, though, right? You got that, that lone electron outside. It wants, this to give, it wants to give it to the acetone. Why does it want to give it to the acetone? Does the oxygen want to take it? You're saying right things. I'm, I'm trying to pull a little more, though, right? Pardon? I heard something. Carbon wants to have four bonds, okay. One's positive and one's negative charge. 
Okay, I see the negatively charged one. Do we have a positively charged species? No. We don't. But we have something that's kind of positively charged, right? Is this bond polar or nonpolar? Polar. Polar, right? So where's the polarity? Where would you put the delta minus and the delta plus on this bond? What would get the delta minus? Oxygen, because it's more electronegative, right? So we'd put a delta minus here, and we'd put a delta plus here, right? So now I kind of see a positive charge. Not a full positive charge, not a real positive charge, but there's a polarity, right? So I'm going to say that this is going to be my Lewis acid, and this is going to be my Lewis base, and the reaction is simply the cyanide attacking the carbon. Now wait a second, carbon can only have four bonds, right? It's already got four bonds, so what has to happen? Bond. I have to break a bond. Which bond do I break? One of the Why one of the bonds to oxygen? It's easier to manipulate the other ones. They're already satisfied. Everything's satisfied. Doesn't necessarily have to be double bonded. Doesn't necessarily have to be double bond. Why? Could. You all are saying right things, but let's, let's dig a little deeper. Right? We know it's polar. That means oxygen's pulling electrons to it. I just heard somebody say that it could have a single bond. It doesn't necessarily have to have a double bond to satisfy its octet. All of these things are correct. Right? There's one other piece, though, that you need to know. Right? We've got sigma bonds and we've got pi bonds. Right? And the sigma bonds are the single bonds. They're really strong. Are pi bonds strong or weak? They're weaker. And why are they weaker? Because there's more distance between the, what's it called? Like there would be more distance between carbon and oxygen. Okay. Okay. If I think about making a sigma bond, actually this might be a pretty good little model here. Right? So if these two are, are two atoms and I make a sigma bond, it ends up being pretty strong. Right? Because the, the orbitals can overlap really well. Pi bonds are where the orbitals just touch on the edge. And it's a bond, but it's pretty weak. Okay? So I can actually break the weak pi bond and put those electrons on oxygen. And in fact, when I do that, what I get is this molecule. Okay? That's nothing more than a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. Lewis base reacts with Lewis acid to give me my product. Okay? We're going to learn a lot of these different things throughout the semester. You are not going to be good at this today. I don't expect you to be good at this today. I expect you to be better at it as we get closer to midterm. Okay? Uh, but understanding this Lewis acid, Lewis base theory is going to be very, very important. Now, the question you all should have for me right now is when you look at this Lewis base, you see that carbon has a, ne uh, has a uh, negative charge and a lone pair of electrons, and nitrogen also has a lone pair of electrons. Why did carbon do the chemistry and not nitrogen? Both of them theoretically could have donated their lone pair. Carbon's more electronegative. More electronegative? Where does it sit on the periodic table? So we've got carbon and then nitrogen, right? So uh, nitrogen's actually a little more electronegative. Okay, so that means that nitrogen probably wants to hold on to its lone pair more than carbon, right? So, so good observation. What else? Yeah? Um, nitrogen has a full octet while carbon is actually expanding out of the octet. Is it? So you're right here. This does have an octet. Two, four, six, eight. But so does carbon, two, four, six, eight. But what does the carbon have that the nitrogen doesn't have? The formal negative charge, right? And so almost always, there are exceptions. This is just a rule of thumb. But when you're trying to identify the Lewis bases, always look for lone pairs and negative charges. That's a good starting place. Okay, so if you can identify lone pairs and negative charges, that's usually a good way to identify the Lewis 
basis. Now let's compare a couple of acids together. Let's see some examples here. So let's look at, look at something like this. And I'm going to make the hydrogen that I want you to take into account black. Which one of those acids is the stronger acid and why? How do we determine the strength of an acid? Now you can look up the pKa value for sure, and the lower pKa value is going to be uh, the, the stronger acid. But chemists sitting in the lab or you being on an exam, you're not going to have a list of all the pKa tables known to mankind, right? So you've got to use some intuition here. What do we know about acids? We know that acids, stronger acids, have weaker conjugate what? Bases. Weaker conjugate bases, right? So I'm going to look at the conjugate base of each of these molecules, right? So if I remove that hydrogen, as a proton, the conjugate base for this is going to be 5. If I do that over here, right, the conjugate base of this is going to be 5. Which one of those anions is the most stable now? And why? More electronegative. More electronegative. It's a true statement. But we learned about four effects. The resonance effect. Okay, so let's, let's look at that. So you're right, I can draw a resonance structure for this, right? H, C, O minus, double bond O. But wait a second, I can also do that here. I can draw a resonance structure as well. You can draw resonance structures for both of them. So is it the resonance effect? Not in the comparison of the two. What other thing do we have going on? Where's the negative charge here? It's always on what atom? It's on oxygen. Where is it at here sometimes? Carbon. Carbon. Sometimes, you know, it's delocalized over the oxygen too, but it's also on carbon. Which atom is more able to handle a negative charge? Something that's more electronegative or something that's more electropositive? Something that's more electronegative, right? And so carbon and oxygen happen to be on the same period. And as we go from left to right, we call that what effect? It's not an inductive effect. It is a periodic trend. That's true. Right? It's the element effect. That's right. So as we go from left to right in the periodic table, that's the element effect. Acidity increases. And as we go down in the family, acidity what? Increases. increases as well, right? So remember, the element effect has both the period effect and the family effect, right? So as we go down a family, the uh, acidity increases as well, OK? I think that's all we're going to cover on that for today. We will have our quiz on chapter two on Thursday. I wanted to cover this before you finish all your problems, okay? I normally will not announce the quizzes, but I did today, all right? So um, keep these kinds of things in mind, okay? It takes practice. You have to struggle through it. Everything in chemistry, actually everything in nature, is a relative comparison. There are very few absolutes in the world. Most absolutes mankind has made up in their mind, okay? Nature works on relative kind of arguments, okay? 
And so that's what we're seeing here. Okay, so one versus the other. Looking at stability. All right, let's get into chapter three. We're going to start talking about a functional group called an alkane or a hydrocarbon. When I say the word hydrocarbon, what comes to your mind? Oil. Oil. Very good. What else? What's in the name? Hydrocarbon. Hydrogen and carbon. When we're talking about hydrocarbons, we are talking about molecules that are, um, that are completely made up of carbon and hydrogen. Okay? By definition, that is what organic chemistry today is in the modern world. You have to have at least one carbon-hydrogen bond or one hydrogen bound to some carbon for it to be considered organic. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. So today we're going to talk about alkanes, a little bit about cycloalkanes. We're going to talk about constitutional isomers. This is where your model kits are going to come into play. Okay? We're going to talk a little bit about naming these things. We call this nomenclature. Okay? You're going to have to be able to name an organic molecule. And we're going to keep it pretty straightforward and simple. Naming organic molecules can get really complex really quick. But the alkanes and the cycloalkanes that we're going to be dealing with are pretty, pretty common. And we're going to talk about different types of carbon and different types of hydrogen atoms. You all may think, looking at the periodic table, that carbon is carbon. But carbon can behave differently depending on what it's bound to. If it's bound to all carbons, it has a very different chemistry than if it's bound to three hydrogens versus two hydrogens versus one hydrogen. Okay? Hydrogen also behaves a little differently depending on what type of carbon it's attached to. So we're going to learn how we can identify the different types of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms. And as you can imagine, I am showing you some pictures here, right, of, of what? Oil stuff, right? Fossil fuels, okay? This is the stuff that made people billionaires, right? There's a lot of energy in hydrocarbons. I'm a big proponent of electric cars, but make no mistake about it, there is no battery in existence that has the energy density of gasoline or diesel. It just doesn't exist. The amount of energy you can squeeze into a gallon of fuel, of hydrocarbon fuel, is enormous. Electric cars will never compete with that. The lightest element on the periodic table that is a metal is lithium. It has a particular density. It will never have the energy density of a hydrocarbon. Okay? And so, I don't see them going away anytime soon. Right? Uh, we depend on these things for more than just fuel. But in terms of hydrocarbons, that's largely what we use them for. We, we put them in our car, we burn them, we put them in our jets and we fly with them. We put them in our spaceships and we go to the moon. Okay? So they are very, very good fuel sources. Okay? There are two main branches of hydrocarbons. There are saturated hydrocarbons and there are unsaturated hydrocarbons. For my friends in here who are in nutrition, what does that sound like? Saturated fats and unsaturated fats. This is where these terms come from. What's healthier for you, saturated fats or unsaturated fats? Unsaturated fats, in fact, polyunsaturated fats, right? Olive oil, pretty good for you. Lard, solid, not particularly good for you, right? It's a saturated fat. We're going to learn about those uh, in this chapter. Even though um, saturated fats are not technically complete hydrocarbons, they have a lot of hydrocarbon to them. They also have carboxylic acid functional groups. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about alkanes, which are saturated. Uh, so you'll have things like this. In the other chapters, we're going to start getting into things that are unsaturated. And unsaturated uh, molecules or hydrocarbons are, are, are hydrocarbons that contain either rings or double bonds. Okay. So let's just do an example. So let's take two carbons and let's bond them together. And let's assume everything else that's attached to those two carbons is hydrogen. How many hydrogens can that take? 
How many hydrogens can I put on there to complete the octet? Three. On each carbon, right? This is a saturated hydrocarbon. The carbons have as many hydrogens as they can possibly have. This has a formula of C2H1. H6. C2H6 is a saturated hydrocarbon. You see that example there on the board. Now if I remove two hydrogens through magic, this is now unsaturated. Why is it unsaturated? Because of the double bond. Those carbons, in theory, could have two more hydrogens, right? Put one on each atom. This is unsaturated. And it is unsaturated by one unit. It has one unit of unsaturation. A unit of unsaturation is H2. I can even remove another unit of H2, and I can get acetylene. That, too, is an unsaturated hydrocarbon. It has two units of unsaturation. Okay? What about a molecule that looks like this? I'm going to draw it out kind of the funny way here. That's called cyclopropane. Is that saturated or unsaturated? Saturated. Is it saturated? Okay, so if I took three carbons and I connected them together in a straight line, how many hydrogens could I put on them? I could put six there, seven, eight, right? So for three carbons, I should be able to put a maximum number of eight hydrogens. How many hydrogens do I have here? So is it saturated or is it unsaturated? It is, now, it is unsaturated. So a unit of unsaturation can be a ring, because I had to take two hydrogens off to connect the, to the ends together to make the ring, right? So anytime you remove two hydrogens from a molecule, we say that that is a unit of unsaturation, okay? So we're going to talk about all of these different things this semester. And there are special ones that look over here on the right. They're called benzene. We're going to talk about those in chapter 9. They're special unsaturated hydrocarbons. They have a lot of special chemistry that we'll be talking about. Okay? So, I heard somebody say early on fossil fuels or oil, right? I just kind of want to give you an idea of what a barrel of crude oil gives us. Roughly, these numbers are probably changing all the time. Right, but you think about getting a crude, a barrel of crude oil which sells for probably, I forget, $75, $77 on the market today. Uh, and you might think that that barrel of crude oil goes to make gasoline and diesel and heating oil, but it does more than that. Out of that barrel of crude oil, I can get approximately, let's just call it 20 gallons of gasoline. So every time you go and fill up your car, and let's say your car hold has a 20 gallon tank, it took an entire barrel of crude oil for you to get your fuel. Okay, and remember a barrel is 55 or 58 gallons, I can't remember the exact volume of the barrel. Okay, but you don't get a full barrel of gasoline out of it. If you happen to drive a diesel vehicle, Every eight gallons, approximately, or eight and a half gallons of diesel that you pump into your vehicle took a gallon of crude oil, or a, a barrel of crude oil, excuse me. Every time you fly on a jet, and every time that jet burns 4.2 gallons of fuel, it took a gallon of crude oil to give you that fuel. You can't fly very far on 4.2 gallons of jet fuel, just to let you know, okay? So when you take a trip from here to wherever, there's a lot of hydrocarbon that you have to throw out the back end of that jet engine, okay? You're going to get about 4.2 gallons of other uh, things called lubricants, waxes, and solvents, okay? Think about it, right? You all use oils, right? You lubricate the chain on your bicycle, your car has oil in it, 
you put oil on the hinges of your doors to keep them from squeaking. These things come from crude oil. You get about three gallons of boiler oil, uh, whatever that really is. Uh, you get 1.3 gallons of asphalt or road oil. That's it. So think about the last time you saw them paving a road for miles. Every barrel of oil only gave them a gallon of asphalt. Can you imagine how many gallons of asphalt it takes to pave a mile of road? When you start thinking about this in terms of barrels of crude oil, it's, it's, it's astonishing, right? And we just spread it out on the ground. And then you get this stuff, the chemical products and plastics. This is really where all the money in oil is, the big money. All this stuff is small money, millionaire kind of stuff. This is billionaire kind of stuff, okay? Uh, you only get about one and a quarter gallons of stuff that can go to make chemical products and plastics. Think of all the plastics you use. Think of all the medications you take. All of that comes from this 1.25 gallons of crude oil. Or uh, 1.25 gallons of the crude oil from the barrel. Okay? That's pretty impressive, right? I mean, all of the plastic that we use today comes from a very small portion. So there's got to be a lot of oil production to keep modern life uh, as we know it. Just to let you know, gasoline typically is what we call 5 carbon to 12 carbon hydrocarbons. Okay? Gasoline is not a pure compound. It is a mixture of all kinds of stuff. You have winter gasoline and you have summer gasoline. They make them differently, believe it or not. Kerosene usually has anywhere from 12 carbons to 16 carbons. And diesel fuel has anywhere from 15 carbons to 18 carbons, okay? So these are not pure things. When you buy diesel, it's not pure diesel. There's no such thing as pure diesel. There's no such thing as pure gasoline. There's no such thing as pure kerosene. There's a lot of different components to these things. Okay? And so how these are made, you can go down around the coast and you can go around in Louisiana and you can see these things as you're driving around. These are uh, petrochemical plants, right? These are, these are distillation columns. Okay? And so what they do is they take uh, crude oil and they heat it up really, really hot. And they boil it. And the really light stuff comes out the top. This is that flare gas that you see, stuff that they don't collect. But this is going to have a boiling point range that's really low. Up here towards the top is also going to be your gasoline fraction, then your kerosene fraction, your fuel oil, your lubricating oil, and the stuff that don't boil, and the stuff that just forms a goop. That forms at the bottom, and that's what we mix with gravel, and we spread on roads, and we call it asphalt. Okay? This is how they take a barrel of crude oil and with what we call fractionated into the components, okay? So you're going to get these light gases. This is going to be things like propane, methane, uh, butane. So if you have a butane grill, this is where this stuff comes from. When they have more of this than they can handle, that's why you see a flare. They have to burn it off. It's just wasted. Uh, gasoline, kerosene fuel oil, and lubricating oil, okay? So you can see gasoline doesn't have a terribly high boiling point range relative to the others, right? Anywhere from 20 degrees to 200 degrees Celsius, on and on and so forth, okay? All right, enough history. Let's talk about the shapes of alkanes. You are going to hear me say straight chain alkane, and you're going to hear me use the word branch, and you're going to hear me use a lot of different words like that, and you got to know what this means. There really is no such thing as a straight chain alkane. Okay, so a straight chain alkane would be something like this. Right? I would I would draw CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. I would call that a straight chain alkane. Why would I call that a straight chain alkane? Because I drew it straight. Pretty simple, right? But if I build a model, each one of these carbons is actually a tetrahedron, right? When you have your model kit, you take the two black pieces, black or carbon, you take two of these pieces and you snap them together. That makes one carbon atom. Take your model kit, put five of these things together and stick them together, and you tell me if it's straight or not.
For ease of the exercise, let's just do three carbons. So we'll take six pieces, pop them together. You see your piece real quick, I'll show you. All right, folks, when you have these, when they're brand new, it can be a little difficult. Take the two pieces, put it together like this, put your thumb on the back, like this, forefinger and thumb, and push, and it will snap. It'll be a little tough until they get wore in. My model kit's so old, it goes together real, real well. Okay? Now, to stick them together, you just take the pieces, you got a piece that's got kind of a hole in the tube, and you got a piece that's got just a straight stick, and you stick them together. Just pop them together. You gotta push until it clicks. Push. There you go. Yep. There you go. So if I put three together, two is straight, right? That's straight. Two carbons are straight. But when I put the third one on, look what happens. It's no longer straight. It's got a kink in it, right? What shape is that? Bent, zigzag, V-shape. Any one of those would work. Now what happens when I put four together? I had the zig and now I've got the zag. Right? What happens when I put the fifth one on? I get that. That, one, two, three, four, five, is this. One, two, three, four, five. Do those look the same? They are not. This is because chemists are lazy when we write stuff out. Okay? Now, when I write this out, did that take me a fair amount of time? I had to write CH3, CH2, 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 CH3, right? It took me a little bit of time. And like I said, chemists were lazy. There's even a faster way to draw this molecule. Now, does that look more like that? Absolutely. What am I seeing here? What are the... What are, Everywhere I have a vertex, those are carbons. This tells me how these carbons are connected together. What is not shown? Hydrogens. Do I have to show the hydrogen? I do not. I do not have to show hydrogens on carbon. I assume that they are there. So I know that since this carbon atom is connected to one and only one other carbon, how many hydrogens have to be on this carbon? Three, right? Since this carbon is connected to two other carbons, how many hydrogens must it have? Two. And this one? Two. And this one? Two. And this one? Two. Very good. You just learned kind of shorthand. Hydrogens on any other atom other than carbon have to be drawn explicitly. You can't draw oxygen with a single bond and leave it alone. If it needs to have a hydrogen, you've got to put it on there. Okay? We'll learn more about that as we talk about other functional groups. Okay? Keep this model. We're going to need it. Do you have a question? Ma'am? Do you have a question? Um, oh. yeah, so you got to get them to where they pop together. So you want to put your like that. And then you will. Got to be rough with them. Got to be a little rough with them. All right. So here's some examples. Right? You can build a model of each one of these, and you, you'll see what we, what we have. Okay? We built the one at the bottom, or I built the one at the bottom. This is called pentane. It's got five carbons. It's going to be called pentane. We'll learn how to name that in just a moment. Okay? But you need to be familiar with this way of writing things, this way of writing things. Okay? You've got to be familiar with both. Okay? So, let's look at some examples of the different types of carbon that are in this chain. You all look at this and you go, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon. 
you say all the carbons are alike. And I look at it and I go, this is a different carbon, this is a different carbon, this is a different carbon, this is a different carbon. Different carbon. They, have, they have different properties, okay? We have what are called primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary carbons, okay? A primary carbon is a carbon atom that is bound to only one other carbon atom. In this molecule, where are the primary carbons? They're on the ends. These CH3s are primary carbons, okay? A secondary carbon atom is a carbon atom that is bound to two other carbon atoms. That would be the ones on the inside. This carbon atom is bound to two carbons. This one is bound to two carbons. This one is bound to two carbons. A tertiary carbon atom is a carbon atom that is bound to three other carbon atoms. This molecule has no tertiary carbons. And a quaternary carbon is a carbon atom that is bound only to other carbons. Okay? You will need to look at a model like this and be able to identify primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary carbon atoms. If you look at this model here, you can see we've got a quaternary carbon, we've got a tertiary carbon, we've got a secondary carbon, and we've got a primary carbon. You need to be able to identify those in any model that I give you. What would be fair on an exam? I could give you a model and I could say, how many primary carbons does this have? Or I could give you a model and I could draw an arrow to a carbon and I could say, what type of carbon is this? Okay? And you need to be able to identify it. Okay? Any questions about that? All right, so primary carbons are attached to how many? Quaternary? Secondary? Tertiary? Very good. Now we can talk about hydrogens. There are primary, secondary, and tertiary hydrogens. There are no quaternary hydrogens because you can ha not have a hydrogen on a quaternary carbon. Okay? A primary hydrogen is a hydrogen atom attached to a primary carbon. How many primary hydrogens does this molecule have? I've got two carbons, and how many does each carbon have? Three. Three. So I have a total of six primary hydrogens on pentane. Okay? These are primary hydrogens. These are primary hydrogens. Secondary hydrogens are hydrogens that are attached to secondary carbons. How many secondary hydrogens do I have? Four. I also have six. Turns out I have six primary hydrogens and I have six secondary hydrogens. How many tertiary hydrogens do I have? Zero. I think I heard that. Yes. There are no tertiary carbons in this particular molecule. But you can see it here. That is a tertiary hydrogen. It's attached to a tertiary carbon. That is a secondary, or those are secondary hydrogens. It is attached to a secondary carbon, primary and so on. Okay. It turns out that in chemistry, primary hydrogens react differently than tertiary and secondary. Okay, they all have different special chemistries that'll be helpful. Okay? So, I've got five carbons connected together. Is this the only way I could have connected them together? Right? Is that the only way I could have connected those two? How else could I connect them together? Now wait a second. Let's say I take the carbon off of the end and I put it on the other end. Is that any different? No, nope, looks the same, doesn't it? I didn't make any change. But what happens if I take this primary carbon off here and I move it onto one of the secondary carbons? Is that the same? Clearly looks different, doesn't it? Right? So I can use my model kit to figure out how many constitutional isomers I can make. Did I change the formula? No. no. Still got the same number of carbons and hydrogens. I just moved them around. Right? This is C5, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 
C5H12. This is C5H12. Can I do anything different? You bet I can. I can move this one and I can move it to the middle. Now I have this molecule. Okay? This molecule happens to be, uh, you know, that one down there at the bottom. I made that. How many quaternary carbons does this one have? The one that I'm holding. How many secondaries? Zero. How many tertiaries? Zero. How many primaries? Four. Right? These on the ends, these four carbons are only attached to one other carbon. Okay. These are called constitutional isomers of one another. C5H12 has one, two, three constitutional isomers. How many constitutional isomers do I have for C3H8? None. I can move things around, but all I do is I get the same thing that I started with. Okay? So you have to have at least four carbons before you can have constitutional isomers. Okay? They are called constitutional isomers because they are connected differently. An isomer means that you have the same formula. They're all C5H12, but they are connected differently and they are different molecules. They have different chemistry, they behave differently, you can use them for different things, okay? In fact, the molecule that you see here, what we would call straight chain pentane, is horrible in your gas tank. Your car does not run very well on that. But they will add small amounts of this isomer down here to help keep your fuel running right in your engine. Okay? Because it's branched, because it's got quaternary carbons. Okay? It behaves differently. These are constitutional isomers. I can do some of this in my head. Some of you might be able to, but I bet you can't. Use your model kit. When you're working your homework problems, use your model kit. It is not cheating. It is using your tools, okay? Use your model kit, okay? So let's look at some of the names and molecular formulas for some of these so-called straight chain alkanes. Methane is one carbon. Ethane is two carbons. Propane is three carbons. Butane is four carbons. Pentane is five carbons. Hexane is six carbons. Heptane is seven carbons. Octane is eight carbons. Nonane is nine carbons. And decane is ten carbons. I am going to hold you responsible on an exam for the first ten. If I say a molecule with ten carbons in its longest chain, you need to know that that's decane. Six carbons is hexane. Seven carbons is heptane. Okay? But your book goes out to 20. 11 is undecane, 12 is dodecane, uh, 13 is tridecane, so on until you get to 20 carbons, and that's called icosane. In biochemistry, you will probably talk about this little molecule called icosanoids, which are biomolecules that cause fever, pain, inflammation, arthritis, and control a variety of other biological functions. They call them icosanoids because guess how many carbons are in them? Right? It's not, it's, not, it's not rocket science, right? You will see that the condensed structural formulas on the, on the right, but again, I want you to pay attention to the first 10. So do we need to know the structural formula for all 10? You need to know the structure formula for all 10 of those. You need to know how many carbons and how many hydrogens are in each of the first 10, okay? 
So, now let's figure out how to name these types of molecules. All naming or all nomenclature really boils down to being able to identify three things. A prefix, a parent, and a suffix. This is an example in science where there are rules there for a reason and you have to follow them to a T. You don't get to have artistic license with this. It is based on logic. Okay? And you always start with the parent. You start in the middle. The parent tells us how many carbon atoms are in the longest continuous chain of the molecule. Longest continuous chain of the molecule. So if the parent was hexane, how many carbon atoms would you think are in the longest continuous chain? Hexane is six, six carbons, right? So you would, you would find six carbons in the longest parent chain. The suffix is going to tell us what functional group is present. We'll learn more of those as we go on this semester. But for right now, we're only talking about alkanes. So the ending is A-N-E. So, hexane, the ending is A N E, and that tells me that it is a saturated hydrocarbon. Hex tells me how many carbons are in that longest chain, six. Okay? The prefix is going to tell us what's attached to that longest chain and it's going to tell us where it is located. Okay, so we're going to work some examples. But it really does come down to these three things. Every time you name a molecule, these are the three rules you have to follow. You have to find the parent chain, you have to identify the suffix, and you have to identify the prefix. Okay? Now, as you can imagine, those three parts seem pretty simple until you start to do it, right? They're simple examples and they're more complicated examples. We'll work through a few of them, okay? So, again, for the parent, I'm going to hold you responsible to the first ten. So if your longest chain has one carbon atom, it's going to be meth. Not the drug, right? <laughs> Just M-E-T-H. So methane this is natural gas. It only has one carbon atom in its parent chain. F is two, prop is three, but is four, pent is five, hex is six, hept is seven, oct is eight, non is nine, and dec is ten. The book may hold you responsible for some problems for some other ones. You can look that up. But you need to be able to know the first 10. Okay? So, what would the parent name be for something with seven carbons? Pent. Or no, not pent. Did I say seven or did I say five? Seven. I said seven, so it's hept, right? I'm confused myself, I'm sorry. Okay? There are going to be other things that are bound to that longest chain. We call those alkyl groups. An alkyl group is formed by removing a hydrogen atom from an alkane. So for example, there's my longest continuous chain. I can put a group right here. That is an alkyl group. It is connected to the longest chain. And that looks like methane if I just look at that group minus a hydrogen. So this is a methyl group. Okay, so this right here is a meth for the one carbon, YL to tell me it's an alkyl group. It is a methyl group. Okay, so we can have methyl, we can have ethyl, we can have propyl, we can have pentyl. You're usually not going to get much higher than butyl though. 
simply because if you get many more carbons than that, they usually belong to the longest chain and it's taken care of in the parent anyway. Okay? We'll see some examples. So here's an example, right? There's the longest continuous chain is in green. How do I know that that's the longest continuous chain? Okay, but how do I figure that out? It's easy because I've given it to you color coded. I'm not going to give it to you color coded on an exam. How would you know that that's the longest parent chain? It is straight, but the longest chain doesn't have to be straight. If I start here, I go one, two, three, four. Or I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Or I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The longest continuous chain means I get the longest number of carbons without ever lifting my pencil. I never have to lift my pencil to include all of those carbons. Let me give you a little tip. When you've identified the parent chain, the longest continuous chain, take your pencil and circle it. Everything inside that circle is the parent chain. How many carbons are in this parent chain? 10, so this is going to be what kind of molecule? It's going to be a decane, right? This is going to be a decane molecule. Everything that sits outside of the circle is an alkyl group. This is a methyl group because it only has one carbon. This has two carbons, so it's an ethyl group. So this is some kind of ethyl methyl decane in terms of its name, okay? We've got to figure out. I can't just tell you, show me a model of ethyl methyl decane, you all would come up with something different and they would all probably be close to right, right? So we got to figure out where the groups are, right? So let's, let's skip that. That's on naming alkyl groups. So let's look at an example. Find the car uh, parent carbon chain here, right? If you look at this, this mole, the, the way these carbons are arranged and the way that they're arranged here is identical. But I could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or I could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I could have also done seven that way. Eight beats seven every day, right? So this is going to be an octane parent, okay? Do not get tricked by this. It does not always go from left to right. Okay, it does not always go from left to right. So, this chain could have been bent like this, or it could have been bent like this. Because guess what I can do with my model kit? I can put all my stuff together, I can bend it any way that I want to, right? And so it could be on the, on the exam any way that it needs to be, okay? But you always find the longest chain, regardless of whether it bends or zigs or zags, as long as you don't lift your pencil to get to the next carbon, it's part of the longest continuous chain. Okay? The next thing that you have to do is be careful about when you have two chains that are of equal length. Okay? If I look at both of these, right? I've got seven carbons in the longest chain here, and I've got seven atoms in the longest chain here. Okay? You always are going to take um, the chain. Now, these are the same thing, right? They're just, we're just counting the chain differently. We're counting it if we went here versus if we went here. It's seven this way. It's also seven this way. But you are always going to pick the chain when you run into this situation that has the most substituents. Right? So if you think of these uh, things here as being our circle, this has one alkyl group hanging off of it. This one has how many? 
2. So you're going to pick this as your numbering system. That's going to be your longest chain. It's going to be this one, not this one. Okay? So seven carbon atoms is going to be what kind of parent? Heptane. What kind of alkyl groups do you see on there? I see an ethyl and a methyl. This is going to be some kind of ethyl methyl heptane. Okay? We're going to go with this. We would not call it this one, okay? Because this one has more substituents. That's the rule. So we've got the parent, we've got the substituents. Now we have to figure out where the substituents are. So we have to number that longest carbon chain. And there's a couple of ways to number it. I can number it, once I've identified it, I can number it from left to right, or I can number it from right to left. And again, this isn't English class. This isn't always from left to right. You have to you figure out which way to number. It turns out here that you're going to number from the left to the right, not the right to the left, because you come to the first substituent at carbon number two. Here you come to the first substituent at carbon number what? Three. Two is less than three. You're going to want to give your substituents the lowest possible what we call location number or locant. Okay? So here I know I've got a methyl group on carbon number two. I know I have a different substituent here at carbon number five. I have a different substituent here at carbon number six. We'll figure all that out in just a moment. There are going to be times when the first substituent is the same distance from both ends. So if I number from left to right here, you'll notice that carbon number two is the first substituent, but it's also the first substituent if I number the other way. Right? So what do I do now? Now I look at the next substituent. Right? Well, I come to the next substituent here at carbon number what? Three. So that would give me substituent at carbon number two, a substituent at carbon number three. But here it would be two and what? Four. Three is less than four. So this is the correct way of numbering. So I'm going to have substituents for this molecule at carbons two, three, and five. We want those location numbers to be the smallest possible number that we can do. Okay. Now what you do is you figure out um, you, you have to figure out whether numbering the carbon chain results in the same numbers from either end of the chain. And that can happen. Right? If I number 1 through 7 this way or 1 through 7 this way, my groups are going to be C3 and C5 in both cases. But now you assign the lower number alphabetically to the first substituent. Okay? So here I come to my ethyl group at carbon number three. Here I come to my ethyl group at carbon number five. E comes before M in the alphabet. So the ethyl group takes numbering priority. So I'm gonna, this is going to be my correct numbering. I'm going to number from left to right because the ethyl group comes at carbon number three. So what do you got to know? You got to know how to, how to count to ten. You got to know how to draw a circle. You have to know how to use the alphabet. And those sound simple, but you've got to remember to do them. It will be in your best interest on, in your notes to include your own method of a checklist of how to go through and name a hydrocarbon, okay? In your own words so that you don't forget a step. It is easy to forget a step. It is easy to look at this and go, oh, well, that's obviously it, right? And, and just be done with it, when in fact there could have been another numbering. So always make sure you check both sides, okay? All right. Very important. Every carbon is going to belong to either the longest chain or to a substituent. It cannot belong to both. That's why I said circle. Once you circle it, 
All of the carbons inside that circle belong to the parent chain or the longest chain. Everything outside belongs to some type of alkyl group, but they can't belong to both, okay? Very important to remember that. Each substituent will have its own number. Each substituent will have its own number. So, how many substituents do I have on this particular molecule that's shown here? Three. I've got three. Each, so I'm going to have to have at least three, I'm going to have to have three location numbers. One for each of those uh, substituents, okay? Notice that two of those substituents are the same substituent. Both of them are methyl, right? I will not write that down as 2-methyl, 6-methyl. I will write that as 2-6-dimethyl. And when we get to the name, you'll see how this works out. So you've got to know di is 2, tri is 3, tap is 4, pent is 5. So if you had five methyl groups, it would be pentamethyl, whatever. Okay? So, we've got all the pieces together. So you're going to identify all the pieces of a compound, right? So here we've got a molecule that's got eight carbons. We've got an ethyl group here. We've got a methyl group here. We've got a methyl group here. We've decided that we're going to number from left to right because that gives me the first substituent at carbon two. If I numbered from right to left, that'd give me the first substituent at carbon number three. So this is the right numbering system. So number all your carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I know that at carbon number two, I've got a methyl group. I know that at carbon number uh, was six, I've got a methyl group. And at carbon number five, I've got an ethyl group. Now I've got to put all this together, right? So I've got two methyls. So that's going to be dimethyl, and they're located on carbons two and six. Notice the, the nomenclature. Numbers are always separated by a comma, and numbers are always separated from letters by a hyphen. You can't write this. That is not 2,6-dimethyl. That is 26-dimethyl. doesn't make any sense. 2 comma 6 dash dimethyl. That tells me that there are two methyl groups located at carbons 2 and 6 of the longest parent chain. There is also an ethyl at which location? At C5. All right. So I know that the parent is op because there's eight carbons in the longest chain. I know it's a pure hydrocarbon, so the ending is A and E, so it's octane. This is 5 dash ethyl dash 2 comma 6 dash dimethyl octane. What does that tell me? It tells me I've got eight carbons in the longest chain. At carbons 2 and 6, I've got a methyl group, and at carbon 5, I've got an ethyl group. I can put that name into a computer, and it will draw the structure for me. I have a program that does that. And it can do that because this is systematic. Does it matter, because you've said 5-ethyl, 2-6-dimethyl, would you be able to put, switch that and do like 2-6-dimethyl and then 5-ethyl, or are there rules? No, there are rules. We have to alphabetize, right? Ethyl comes before methyl, E before M. We don't worry about the thing that tells us how many there are. Ethyl before methyl. So you're always going to do this alphabetically. So it is 5-ethyl, 2-6-dimethyl, octane. What might I expect on an exam? I might give you a name and ask you to pick the correct structure, or I might give you a structure and ask you to pick the correct name. All of my exams are multiple choice, right? But I will give you space to work and write, and you will need to do that, okay? Any questions? We do get to have our model kit for easy. You get to have your model kit. You get to have your own handwritten notes. Okay. That's what I thought. You just don't get your partner. You don't get me. And you don't get the book. 
or the internet. You can even have a calculator that's not connected to the internet. Don't need one yet, but sometime you will. All right, I want you all to get together in groups and I want you to take that condensed structure and I want you to give me the name of it. Take, um, take about three minutes and then we'll, we'll work through it. And that'll probably get us through to the end of the day. Did I throw you all a curveball? Yeah. A little bit, didn't I? Why did I throw you a curveball? I want you to know, while I'm here in front of you, when I'm working these problems, you all will look at them and go, that's easy, that's easy, that's easy. But when you have to look at a problem that you've never seen before, so easy it ain't, right? It's a simple molecule. It doesn't have a whole lot of carbons. It doesn't have a whole lot of hydrogens. But how I've represented it to you is a little different than what I just talked about, right? I gave you a condensed structural formula. It's not a bond line drawing. It's not a stick like we were talking about, right? So the first thing that you want to do is you want to look at that and you want to say, I'm going to convert that to a stick structure. Now, I know a few people that can look at that and come up with the name. But I'll tell you what, I can't. And I've been doing this for 25 years. So if I can't do it with 25 years of experience, chances are if you wait till the night before the exam to figure this stuff out, you ain't going to get it either, OK? So, the easiest thing to do when you see a structure like this is to simplify it and simplify it into its actual structural components, okay? So, if you look at this, this CH right here is this carbon. That is a CH that is bound to a CH2, CH3, and bound to another CH2, CH3, which is what is represented in the parentheses, right? So, there's two of them connected to this carbon. This carbon is also connected to a CH2. It is also connected, this one is connected to a CH that happens to have two CH3s attached to it. You were close. I think you had one more carbon. But you were close. Now I can start to see that and I can start to use my rules. What's the first thing that we do? We find the parent. What's the longest continuous chain in this molecule? 
One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Every way I go, six is the longest, right? So this is going to be what parent? Hex. It's going to be a hex parent. The, sub, the, the ending is going to be what? A and E. So this is going to be something hexane, right? So I'm going to circle my longest chain, and I'm circling this one. Note that I could have circled this one, and it's exactly the same thing. Okay? Now what do I got to do? Right? This is my this is my parent. So I circle it. Now what do I do? I gotta find the groups. What are my groups? I've got a methyl group and I've got a ethyl group. Now I gotta figure out where to put them or where they're at, right? So I got a number. Well I can number from left to right that I'm putting here in green. Or I can number right to left. Which one's correct here? Right to left looks to be correct to me. Why is that? Is it ethyl versus methyl? That's glad. It never shows one point, right? So, yeah, the first substituent here is methyl, and it occurs at 2. Or if I go this way, the first substituent I come to is ethyl, but it happens at carbon number three. This is what I call the first point of branching rule. The first point of branching here is at carbon two. The first point of branching here is at carbon three. Okay? So, if I go with the green naming, I end up with three ethyl, five methyl hexane. And if I go with the white numbering, I end up with four ethyl, 2-methylhexane. Which one's correct? The white one is the correct one, right? A little happy spinny face. So again, that's because of the, it branches first. That's down. right. But here's what you all are going to do. If I gave you this structure and I gave you these as choices, among four choices or five choices, many of you would pick this. Uh, excuse me, this. Because you would say, oh, that puts ethyl at the lowest number. You, you would probably say three comes before four. But that's not the rule. The rule is the first point of branching. Two versus three. So this doesn't matter. The four and the three. right? It matters the first point of branching. The two versus the five. So you can name them both ways, and then you can make a decision based on that. Yes, ma'am. Why would you not put the two in front of ethyl? Like, why would it be two, four? It, because if it were two comma four, that would, that, would mean, that would mean that you had two ethyl groups. This is telling me that on carbon number four, there is one ethyl group, and on carbon number two, there is one methyl group on a hexane parent. That's because of the alphabet, too, right? You're doing E before M. E before M, that's right. All right, next time we will pick up with cycloalkanes and finish the rest of the chapter. We will work some examples. Work your homework. That is the only way to get good at this. Your head will hurt a little bit, so have some Tylenol, all right? It's okay. There's a lot of rules to this. But I know you all can do it. I'll see you all on Thursday. Don't forget, we will have quiz on Chapter 2, so have all that ready. And I will see you all then. Have a great rest of the day, and I'll see you on Thursday.